briefly, I, uh, that, that was a perfect introduction, actually. So um, I'm a technical evangelist at Microsoft. I basically work with the startups and with new technologies that Microsoft releases. So we work on these uh, ascent cases where we basically try to publicize uh, the cool, new, innovative ways on how to use technology. And uh, parts of that is actually presented here. So that's cognitive services and what we are actually trying to do with this. Um, I'm going to mention three things, basically. Cognitive services as a whole, what does it contain, how to use that. I'm probably going to spend like 20, 20 minutes maybe around this. I don't want to go too deep. If you want to know more, just reach out to me and I can actually give you a demo and show you to the right direction how to try these services and so on. Uh, so cognitive services is one. Uh, Azure Functions is to, uh, second. And uh, Azure Logic Apps is the third. And uh, to very briefly go through these, the whole point of this uh, cognitive services that you're offering is to make it very easy for you to actually create apps quickly, easily, and affordably. So we basically offer the full stack of visual speech, language, knowledge, and search. Vision basically sees and has uh, intelligence, so it can actually detect things. Speech uh, recognizes speech by identifying speakers, different languages, uh, beyond accents, beyond uh, any kind of uh, context. It can actually understand what you're saying and then pass it forward. Language um, processing detection of uh, inappropriate language, detection of uh, of intent, what the users are trying to say, knowledge tapping into the uh, databases, into the uh, data sources like Wikipedia, like uh, social media, like your own databases. Then search, which actually has the uh, Bing APIs. So we do know that in Europe, Bing is eh, uh, and not really used, but it basically uses the same search algorithm that can be used across your own applications. And then labs, which has uh, a new emerging concepts. But this technically basically means, so are all of these different services beneath each of the, uh, each of the main pillars? And they all fall under cognitive services. And how do you use this stuff? Basically, wherever you're creating the app, it's just the REST API call. That's as simple as it is. Um, all of these are available from Azure, and you can basically set them up in any of the data centers that you want across the world. Uh, some of them are more limited than the other ones, so some of the services may not be yet available in, for example, Western Europe, uh, while they first come to West US and then they flow across the world. And how we publicize these and what do we actually do is we create the services, we launch them, so for example, everything that you see under labs over there, we publish that uh, for free for some time, which is usually three to six months, which lets people try the services, see if this is actually usable, if this makes sense. And then after that, uh, we do a priced model. Usually the priced model means that you get something for free. So for example, when we are doing, um, for example, uh, uh, what do I say? Let's say translation, you get uh, like 20,000 free translations, and after that, you start paying like a few cents or uh, uh, parts of a cent to actually do some things. Um, and like I said, the whole idea is that this would be as easy as possible, that it is completely flexible, so you basically can use it from any uh, surface that you want. So for uh, Node.js and uh, C Sharp, we already have pre-made samples. So if you go on the site, you'll actually see the samples. You can directly try them out. If you want to use something else, you can uh, find open source components of that. And our whole attitude in the past uh, four years has been that let's open source everything. And if you follow the news, we have been one of the, uh, or not one of the, the top contributor of open source on GitHub uh, past year. So basically, all the stuff that we build around the cognitive services, around the Azure services, we publish as open source so that people can actually use that, rebuild something on top of that, and do something, uh, build something completely new and innovative uh, on top of uh, the core services that you provide. And that's our basically our business model. We want to provide that core, and you build whatever you want to build 
on top of it. I will show that. that. Now, I want to highlight on a few things from, uh, from each of these. So Vision, uh, which I personally think is really super cool. Uh, Vision is actually, I don't know, I'm kind of debating on which one is the coolest one. Um, vision has obviously the computer vision, which allows you to detect uh, people, detect emotions. You can detect real live streaming images. So basically, if we have a camera filming uh, people over here, I can get real-time statistics on how interested are people in certain topics, how they're feeling, and basically get a sense of the crowd. So that's Emotion API and uh, Video API. Then we have stuff like Content uh, Moderator, which uh, allows you to uh, filter out either inappropriate content based on a very simple uh, parameters or actually uh, identify the content and uh, filter it based on what do you want to have. So let's say, for example, that you have a website and on that website you're uploading only pictures of cats and only pictures of cats are appropriate. So what happens is you let people actually upload the image. When the image is uploaded, it goes into the blob storage and this requires zero servers, zero uh, infrastructure in the back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it works. It works. It works. Works. Okay. So, um, so they upload a picture of a cat, or let's say that somebody goes really mean and uploads a picture of a dog. What happens is the picture goes, stores in a blob storage, goes for the content moderator. The content moderator comes back with a text. Hey, this is a picture of a dog. And what you are looking for is within that text, you're actually looking at, is there a word cat in this description? And just pick up, oh, there's a cat. OK, this is fine. This is a cat picture. This is a very easy demo. I have it actually on my machine. And I, can, I can show that. I'm actually, if you're interested uh, in that demo on stage, actually, with the content moderator. And um, that's super cool because it gives you a textual representation of what that image is. It's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty darn close. So. Um, and then uh, this one, the custom vision server. Oh, actually, let me jump back. Video indexer actually allows you to do, if you're doing any video image processing, to do actual live uh, image editing so it can actually index the video on a specific parts. But the really cool one is the custom vision service, which uh, in our example, for example, you can uh, film this table over here and do custom vision uh, pattern on it and basically say, hey, this is what a Samsung phone looks like, this is how Crestron device looks like. And after that, you can go and ask the cognitive services, where is the, the Crestron device? And it can actually locate it across different rooms, spaces, whatever it is monitoring. The only things that you actually need to provide it after you have done the custom vision recognition for it, you actually need to provide it like a video feed, and it can tell you there is the device, there is what you're looking for. And it's one of the samples that we are actually trying to implement over here in the Maker Sub, which would allow you to say, it's like, where is that 3D printer? And it's like, oh, there's the 3D printer. So it can actually highlight uh, that this is, this is the device that you're looking for. And the speech, uh, speech used together with the Translate API basically allows you to go through 84 different languages. So you can basically speak in any language. Or you can even do custom speech service so that if you want to support any languages that are not supported here, you can actually use that. And then through the speech recognition API, you can basically just pick up uh, what is the text. And then, like I mentioned there, the translation over here basically allows you to translate that text from anything to anything. Now, obviously, translators are not very good. But when we're talking about the context of bots, the bots really need to understand what the user means. It's not 100% translation that matters. It's that the bot actually understands. So we, how we tested this, we basically said in a few languages, like people don't say, hello, I will need insurance. Nobody's going to type that. They're going to type, yo, give me insurance. And that can actually be recognized by a translator in whatever language. And from there, it actually flows into LUIS, Language Understanding Intelligence Service, 
which you teach. Uh, it's a basically um, teach based on the certain questions and patterns that what the user is actually looking for. And we tested this with some really crazy sentences and surprisingly accurate to pick up on what the user's actual intent on some of the cases are. So um, on the knowledge, uh, just very quickly, I want to highlight one of the things over here. So we have recommendations API, uh, or actually two things, recommendations API, which does that very famous product recommendation. So it basically goes and analyzes your data, and then based on the other consumer uh, patterns, recommends something for you. And, but the coolest thing from the knowledge uh, the stack is the Q&A maker, which is zero effort, I made a bot. So this is zero code, purely clickable uh, user experience. So you point Q&A maker to an existing Q&A, to a web page, to a website, and let it learn. And it will basically build questions, intents, everything for you, and actual answers to those questions. So using that, you can basically go from zero to a uh, functional bot uh, in, a, in only a few minutes. And we have actually done this when we met with our customers. We go for a meeting. Some of us are showing on the stage, OK, this is how you would use a bot. And while we are talking, we do the same demo. So another person is actually writing the whole thing. And then we actually can show them on their own data, this is how this bot will actually look like, because it literally takes like 10 minutes to create. Um, a couple of others from the Bing search, um, even though I, I'm fully aware of the, uh, um, how would I say this, um, slight limitations of the Bing search engine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the things that you usually would require from it, it is actually pretty OK to use in this context. So for example, if you uh, need to pull a picture of a cat, Bing Image Search API, uh, or if you need to detect or find similar images, or uh, find uh, suggestions or something, then all of these are basically just purely useful. You just use the query from there. Uh, but I don't want to stack too much on that. Now, there, this is now from the lab, so this is now a few projects uh, which are actually being worked on. Uh, these are not public, these are preview cognitive services. So we have um, stuff like uh, gesture-based controls. We have uh, score location attractiveness and so on. So these basically can be tested out at this point. I don't want to talk too much about these because they will uh, eventually change even more as the time progresses. But I think that was the highlights of that. Um, basically, if you want to start using any of those services, then it's basically Microsoft.com slash cognitive. And this is uh, how you basically use the services. Now, I promised I'm going to talk about two more things. I'm just going to just check my time. OK, I have a few minutes left. So, um, so this is cognitive services. All of this you get as a platform. No infrastructure, no nothing, you just use it. Now, uh, when we're talking about your applications and building that bot, uh, you already had a chat about the bot framework and how that allows you to create this uh, uh, structure that allows you to publish to any platform. So basically, uh, building that chat into any service. Now, beyond this, uh, what happens is that you would use the, some of the cognitive services, but you have files to be stored, you have some data to be stored, uh, you want to retrieve something, you have customer data. So how do you manage all of this? Um, are you all familiar with this serverless, basically, points of the serverless? Yes. Okay. So uh, Azure Functions is basically a serverless uh, model, which allows you to deploy just the code and run the code. So we have actually two different uh, models how you can do this. So you can do Node.js, deploy Node.js over there. And we provide uh, around 20 different triggers that uh, will trigger your uh, functions to execute <laughs> some events, uh, or uh, trigger to execute some code. And those, for example, can be just a simple HTTP request, or a file dropped into a blob storage, 
or um, basically any kind of interaction coming from the user to any of the services. Some of the common ones that we use is, for example, our event hub. So when we have IoT devices, IoT devices send this little piece of information, it flows directly into the event hub, and then we have uh, functions triggered based on the event hub events. Now, uh, why is this interesting? Uh, the Node.js code can be deployed as such, run as such, only on demand, and you're basically paying 0 0.000014 uh, dollars per gigabit second of the executed code. So very basically nothing, uh, and you're paying only for the code that's being ex executed. Now this is not, uh, this is for all of the functions. Now, as I said, you can develop it with Node.js, but there's another option. If you're familiar, and I know that most of the people, unfortunately, we meet in startup space are not familiar with C-sharp or using C-sharp. With C-sharp, we can actually do one more cool thing, which apparently not a lot of the platforms can do. Um, you can actually do local debugging of these things. So how this works is uh, from the Visual Studio, you create your c -sharp function, and it is actually compiled into a DLL. And we actually, the whole Azure Functions uh, runtime is run on your machine as it is run in the cloud. It's one executable that's running on your machine. So on your machine, pressing F5 will turn the debugger on. And the cool part is this, that function runtime is actually tapping into the same events in the cloud. So when I'm dropping a file, if I have an issue in production and a user calls me that, hey, I upload a file and it doesn't get processed and there is an error and I don't know what's happening. You don't want to start debugging in production and it's really sometimes difficult to catch the data what's happening. Now with this, you can actually start it on your own machine and it's going to be listening for the cues, for the triggers, for anything that is actually happening in the cloud and react on those. And um, now, how does this actually relate to, to all the rest of the things? You basically then connect all of these little functions that do different things. So these small black boxes that take input and put something out. And this is the, actually the other cool thing. We are not limiting what's the output of functions. You can basically output anything. You can do anything. You're pretty free to do whatever uh, you want. Now, how do you tie these functions together? through Logic Apps. Logic Apps basically is a drag and drop style interface that allows you to build a workflow of different functions on a, on, and of different stuff that you want to be executed. So going back to the example of, um, of the, of the uh, cat upload service that I mentioned a second ago. So how does the cat upload service architecture for this, uh, this uh, bot look like? I have a chat interface in Facebook. Uh, my user starts chatting with me. I have dialogues popping up, and it allows me to categorize some information. And now the user wants to upload the picture. At this point, I have zero backend still existing because everything is running through the services. When he uploads the picture, the picture gets picked up directly into the blob storage, which gets stored into the uh, queue. Uh, runtime is actually actually listening to the queue and then processing the image based on that and then responding back to the bot, hey, this is what happened. So all of this was actually built without basic infrastructure. So all the servers are gone and, and even platform as a service is already starting to become old from our perspective. So if you can split it into these small pieces that you can track, it makes a lot of sense. The cool part comes from uh, the kind of the management of all of this is that, okay, um, like, like in the first slides, I've been doing this for a very long time, and I'm coming in my mind, I'm also used to like monolithical applications, ERP systems and such. So, okay, let's split it into 50 different little pieces. How the heck do I manage all of this? Now, this is where actually the, um, Application insights and API management comes into place, which allows you to have an overview of the whole stack of your functions and it actually builds this uh, for you. So when you publish all of these different services, it's actually going to display one single view of end-to-end -end how the application flows. So every time that there's a fault somewhere in this chain, the application insights actually stops it 
and says, hey, there's a red box over here. It tracks what's happening and so on. The cool thing about that, it actually doesn't require any code. It requires that you put an instrumentation key so it knows to where it is writing, and then it's just picking up your trace logs, and that's it. So it knows what's happening to the service. Uh, that was, I think, my 20 minutes. Um, any questions? I think uh, a lot of people are overwhelmed by the information and the amount of APIs you, you just gone through in 20 minutes. Yes, I tend to do that, I'm sorry. Uh, so so uh, I usually pour like a shitload of information. It's like, here you go, do something with it, build something cool. Um, so the easiest way is, uh, if you remember Microsoft.com slash cognitive or aka.ms slash cognitive, start trying out these services. The cool thing is all of the services actually have uh, their own uh, test uh, pages on the site directly. So if you want to try the image recognition, speech recognition, uh, the uh, language translation services, anything like that, you know, just go in there, there's a box where you upload the file or enter the text or do anything there, and you can actually try it uh, out from there. And if you need the code sample, just tap on the Node.js code sample and uh, uh, you can get started from there. If you actually want to start building something with it, if you're a startup, uh, we give you BizSpark for free, and you get to use all these services for free. Uh, if you are not, uh, you get to start using the services for free for a month, and after that, it's a basic normal pay-as-you-go model. And since all the services are based on how much you're actually consuming, you shouldn't consume a lot when you start using them. But if you're a startup, I highly encourage you to sign up for BizSpark program. It's a no commitments program, which allows you to get up to $120,000 in uh, Azure credits uh, to use basically on any services that you have there so you can deploy all of the stuff. But for me personally, the kind of the intelligent things that actually can, uh, to, to us even when we were testing like last week, uh, the, the amazement from the people that came when uh, we were doing the translation and the customer requested we need to support uh, Finnish, English, Russian, Swedish. And then we go like, no, we actually support all of the languages. And then people started typing in like uh, in, in uh, um, German, in Bosnian, and like, oh my God, it respond, it knows everything. And it's just basically because it's a one translate API, you send a message to it, it will do automatic uh, language detection, and then it goes through loose, and then through loose it actually comes back like, hey, this is what the user meant. At that point, you know what was the language of the request, and if you're prepared, then you have your resource files which will have translations, and you can give uh, an answer to the user basically back in the same language. Uh, if not, then you just default to English or any other language. So, hey, sorry, I don't speak that language. I understand what you mean, but I'm not quite proficient in saying it. Or if you really want to go a little bit risky, then you can translate your English translations directly and push them out. But that's, I would not recommend that. That's edgy. But hey, just go on. double translations. Be there, down that. Failed. Yes, <laughs> yes, that is a short path to user going like, huh? Well, I, I put the horse where? So, yeah. <laughs> no, so <laughs> so uh, that's, the, that's the whole story. I, I would encourage you to try them out. Um, like I said, they're all, uh, pre they're all free for you to try out. And if they suit your needs, uh, I think that's pretty cool. Um, also, on the topic of the bots, still one more thing. There is a, we have a service called Bot Discovery, which basically has all the bots that have been published on top of the Microsoft Bot Framework. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are available through Skype. Uh, some of them are available on the web pages, but if you want to try it out, that's a good place to start. And I don't know, have uh, Andy already mentioned this? There's just one topic that I still want to touch on. Uh, very briefly, uh, we are not trying to make the natural language pure Turing test winning bots in any of these cases. What we are aiming for is to solve a problem that the users are having, and that's why the services are like this. 
So, um, I mean, you can spend uh, years just like fine tuning that conversation model, but instead it's much easier to actually use stuff like dialogues and prompts and cards and stuff like that to actually guide your user through this experience and then try to somehow anticipate what they're looking for, what they want to do. If you require something more, so basically you have the cognitive services, they will uh, have some intelligence, but let's say that you want to learn something from this whole user experience from the engagements, you can basically package all of the data and put it into the actual machine learning, which basically then